Well, good morning. My name is James Tetley, Associate Pastor of Crossroads Church, and it's great that you can be tuning in uh, to listen today. Well, uh, the reading today is taken from John 20, verses 19 to 31. And I'm here in the upper room because this reading is set in the upper room. So if you have your Bibles there, do turn with me to John chapter 20, reading from verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. A word of prayer as we gather together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time and we pray that you would help each one of us to see you more clearly through your word. Amen. Well, it's the third day since Jesus has died and the disciples are gathered in the upper room. They are in lockdown. They are hashtag stay at home. Um, but Peter and John earlier that day have been to the tomb and looked inside and they saw the body was gone. And Mary also had been there. And after Peter and John had left, she had encountered Jesus and she'd come rushing back to the other disciples, proclaiming, I've seen the Lord. I don't think they really believed her at that point in time. And yet after that, in the midst of their loss and pain, Jesus enters. And he says, peace be with you. And he shows them the nail marks in his hands and the holes in his side. And again, he says, peace be with you. And the disciples are overjoyed. The Messiah is back. Jesus has risen. And then he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then he commissions them with a message of forgiveness to take to the world. But one of them is missing. One of them has missing the hashtag stay at home directive. And that one is Thomas. We don't know what he was doing. But after Jesus has left, we read that later Thomas appears. And the disciples rush to him and give him the great news. Jesus has risen. He's back from the dead. Now Thomas, like every other Jew, knew that resurrection would only happen at the end of the age. There was no such thing as one person coming back from the dead, one resurrected person in the middle of time. In fact, throughout all the cultures of the day, no one believed in one resurrected person, one resurrected Messiah. Most cultures didn't believe in resurrection. Uh, Greeks and Romans, they didn't believe in resurrection. And the Jews, well, they believed that at the end of the age, then resurrection would happen when all good Jews would 
be raised. And Sir Thomas says, well, unless I get the evidence, unless I can put my fingers into those nail marks in his hands, unless I can put my hand into his side, unless I can see this person that you're talking about and I can verify that this is Jesus, only then will I believe. Do we see? Many of us have uh, doubts and I wanted to ask one of uh, the members of our congregation about moments of doubt or unbelief they had. So I've asked Mark if he might share a little story about his uh, own, uh, whether he's ever had doubts or unbeliefs. Over to you, Mark. I remember that when I was in my final year of university, I had periods where I faced great anxiety and which on hindsight was probably because I had a fear of future unknowns. And I remember praying often that the Lord would take these anxious feelings away, um, but was met with silence as though I was sometimes talking to a wall. The feelings effect didn't go away for many months and it seemed to get worse. And I started to wonder to myself whether God was listening, whether he cared and whether he even existed. But rather than letting go, I felt like I needed to find a way to control my circumstances even more. Well, thank you, Mark, for sharing that. You see, sometimes we can be worried about talking about our doubts and unbeliefs because people might think badly of us. They might think, oh, what little faith they have. There's doubt there. There's unbelief there. And so we think, well, just keep smiling. Don't tell anyone. You know, just uh, keep smiling. Otherwise, they're going to call you Thomas. Just keep wearing that mask. Let's not talk about it. And yet we've all been through times of doubt and unbelief. And here in this story, we can see that for Thomas, the question was the resurrection of Jesus. How about you? Where's your doubt or unbelief? Maybe it's around the resurrection of Jesus. Maybe it's about the existence of God. Maybe it's about the goodness of God as you look out over this time and you see all these uh, people dying under this virus. Maybe you question the provision of God. Maybe you question the presence of God. Maybe you question the power of God. A time will come when we walk through the valley and those doubts and unbeliefs will appear. And you see in the atmosphere that we live in, it doesn't lend itself to believing in a savior risen from the dead. This is a tough environment to live in here in Geneva. I remember speaking to one African brother of mine um, and he talked about having arrived and said, this environment is a faith dampener. So, but before we hold our down with Thomas signs, boo, bad with you, Thomas. Well done, Thomas. You didn't suppress your doubt and unbelief. You expressed it. There he was in the midst of all those other disciples saying, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord. And he could have just said, well, I should uh, really say the same thing. But no, he had the faith to express his doubt at that time. Maybe some of you are sitting there right now and like, and like Thomas, you're crying out, unless I see, unless I get more evidence, then only then will I have a stronger faith. Well, well done for having the faith to say that. I asked Mark a, a second question, which was, how do you deal? How did you deal? with that time of doubt or these times of doubt when they come upon you? Mark, why don't you share your answer to that question? I was encouraged by my friends and those from church to pray and wait upon the Lord and hold fast to the promises in his word. And I uh, remember that one day I read Psalms 139 and it spoke to me very deeply, especially the verse, you hem me in behind and before, and you have laid your hand on me. And I felt, uh, a deep sense of assurance as though the very words were written to me. And even now when I have periods of where I doubt, I will think of the goodness of God in my life, including this very important period in my life. Well, thank you, Mark. Now at this point, some of you might be saying, Pastor, you just need to tell people to believe. You just need to tell people to have more faith. Tell them, stop having unbelief. Stop having doubt. Just believe. But the problem is, if I did that, then I'd basically be saying, fix yourself. Fix yourself. Come on. 
Just believe more. Just have more faith. Find the resources within yourself to do that. But what would happen when another bump came in the road? When you fell again under another situation? Maybe you, another something happened to you? Surely that same doubt or unbelief would come back. So the question is, what is the solution for Thomas? Well, we see that Thomas sees Jesus. You see, a week later, and Thomas is back amongst the disciples in the upper room. And oh, how interesting it would have been to be a fly on the wall during those weeks to watch those conversations. One could uh, imagine maybe uh, the Thomas pers- trying to persuade the disciples, come on now, come on, don't carry on with this illusion that you have uh, seen Jesus. Or, or maybe the disciples, maybe they prayed and fasted that the spirit of unbelief would come out of Thomas. Or maybe Thomas sat there as each one of them shared their encounter when they saw Jesus and Thomas laughed at them. We'll never know what took place. But a week later, Thomas is there in the upper room with the other disciples. And Jesus enters and he says, peace be with you. And he looks at Thomas and he knows. He knows his doubts. He knows his unbelief. He sees his heart. And what does he do? Does he blast him? Does he say, how dare you? I appeared to all the other disciples and you didn't believe them? These friends that you've been journeying with all these years, you didn't believe them after these years of ministry together? How dare you? What a sinful man you are. You deserve, you deserve to be rejected. Get out of this upper room. No, friends, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful what we see Jesus doing. Because as he speaks to Thomas, he names the very doubts, the very unbeliefs that are in his heart that he's expressed to the disciples. Thomas, I see you struggling at the moment with the fact that I'm risen. Well, place your hands here. Place your hands in the, the, the nail mark if you want to. You can put your hand in, in my side. I know, I know you've asked that. And you can do that if you want to. And we see, as Thomas is before, the crucified, risen Jesus. He cries out, my Lord and my God. Not a Lord and a God, but my Lord and my God. And what does Jesus do? Jesus doesn't say, well, don't call me God. Don't call me that. No, Jesus receives his worship because he knows that he is God. And Thomas knows at this moment, as he is standing before this man, that this is God, the one who created the universe, the one who set the planets into place, the one who made him. This is the son of man. This is Adonai. This is the Lord of of hosts. This is the great I am. This is Yahweh, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says to Thomas, you believed because you've seen me. And then it's almost as the camera turns and focuses on us. And he says, blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. And then John wraps up this chapter by saying the following. This is my paraphrase. There are lots of events that I could have written about, lots of encounters that Jesus did, lots of miracles that took place, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that you may have this Thomas moment of belief and that by believing you may have life in his name. What are we to make of this story? How does it speak to our doubts and our unbeliefs? Well, I ask Mark one last question. What would you say to people who are maybe struggling with doubt at this time? Mark, over to you. Alpha said it. 
it is probably very human to face doubt sometimes. But it's okay that we should hang on to God's promises in his word, uh, remember his past goodness, and wait upon him. Well, thank you, Mark, for uh, sharing these things. But some of you right now, as you've heard this story, might be thinking, oh, if only I could have a Thomas moment. If only I could have a, a Thomas moment. If Jesus right now appeared at the front door and entered in, you know, all my doubts and unbeliefs would be gone. I'd be like Thomas. I'd be crying out, my Lord and my God. I wouldn't have any doubts or unbelief. I wouldn't be questioning the, the presence or the power or the provision of God if Jesus stepped in right here. And right now, my doubts would be gone. Unbelief would be gone. But what about the next time that a problem took place? Yes, you, you might carry you on for a few weeks. What about if your husband left you? What then? Would you not question the provision of God, God's goodness? What about if you lost your job? Would not doubts come? Lord, where are you? What are you doing? What about if you lost someone you loved who you've been praying for? Would you not question the power of God? Would you not be like, well, Jesus, could you just come back one more, more time and re reassure me? What are we to make of this story of Jesus appearing to Thomas? Well, there is one word which appears over and over again in this chapter. And that one word is C. Let's look at some of these occurrences. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Peter saw the strips of linen lying there. The other disciple saw and believed. Mary saw two angels in white. Mary turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. The other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands. And then Jesus' closing words to Thomas. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What are we to make of these seas? What are we to make of the fact that again and again and again we see this word coming up? Well, I think it's obvious. There's one question which the risen Jesus is asking which is, do you see me? You see, as we look at what John says in the very last part of this chapter, he says, these things are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. He, he could have easily put, these things are written, that you may see. You may see, you see, because seeing Christ Seeing Christ makes all the difference. Seeing his beauty, seeing his power, seeing his glory, seeing his majesty, seeing his might, seeing his humility, seeing his loveliness, seeing his mercy. Because when we see these things, then we worship. When we open ourselves to seeing Jesus, when we look upon him, when we gaze at all that he is, then our doubts and unbeliefs are banished. I'm not talking about spending two minutes, you know, reading your Bible through before rushing out of the door. I'm talking about a heart that says, I want to see you. I want you to reveal yourself to me. What might this look like? Well, in my last church, there was an elderly lady called Joan. And I used to visit her and Joan was blind. And what a blessing it was to visit with her. I remember sitting down and she used to share with me. She used to say, I'm blind, I can't see, but I can see Jesus, she said. As I listen to the, the scriptures, I can imagine myself sitting there by the Sea of Galilee as, as he breaks the bread and as the, the, the fish are distributed and as, and as a miracle takes place, it's wonderful. She says, as, as I hear the scriptures, I can Im imagine myself being there 
as that man was healed, as the blind man could see. It was so beautiful, she said. You see, Joan had the eye of faith to see Jesus. You see, what I'm talking about is to allow the person of Jesus to take up more of our vision. You see, because it's the revelation of Christ which brings transformation. True transformation happens when we see the revelation of Christ, when we see his goodness, his beauty, all that he is. It banishes our doubts and our fears. If we went to the last book of Revelation, we see that as people see Jesus in all of his glory, they fall down and worship him. We see that as John gets this vision of a risen Jesus, he falls at his feet as he, see, as he sees all that he is. Again and again in the book of Revelation, as they see Jesus, they fall down in worship. In the Gospels, we see that as they watch him walking on the water, they worship. In the Gospels, we see that as he heals, they see who he is and they worship. As they saw what was in him, they worshipped. I was thinking a little bit about this and there are times when I can upset my, my wife and, you know, I need to apologise for, for those times and I do. But actually, what she's really looking for is, is not really an apology. The question is, is do you, do you love me? That's the question is, do you love me? And if she sees that love, it quells all doubt and fears. You see, when we see Jesus for who he is, when we see his loveliness in all of its glory, then those doubts and fears are quelled. Spurgeon said the following, let the eye of faith be constantly looking to him. Let your heart be full of him. Let him fill more of your vision. Let your faith be focused on him. And John Piper, as he reflected on his own prayer life, said the following, few prayers have I prayed more often than this. Lord Jesus, keep me from drifting away from you. Paul, when he wrote to the church in Ephesus, as he prayed for them, he prayed that they would grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and that they would know this love because he knew that if they grasped that love, if they grasped the depth of Christ's love, the breadth of Christ's love, the height of Christ's love for them, then they would be secure in him. Whatever they may face, whatever challenges they would encounter, they would be secure in him. That, that doubt and unbelief would vanish in the sight of his majesty. Friends, we need to speak to our hearts. We need to speak to our unbeliefs. We need to speak to our doubts and say, look to Jesus, look to him. I want a fuller revelation of his beauty. I want a fuller revelation of his majesty. I want a fuller revelation of his glory and his power. I want to look to him, not to my doubts and my unbeliefs and my failings. I want to look to him and see. I want to see you, Jesus. And this is a prayer that he helps us to answer. And friends, I want to give you an opportunity to do that because as the disciples saw Jesus, they were transformed. As Thomas saw Jesus, his doubts and fears were transformed. You see, we can bring our doubts and unbeliefs and we can look to Jesus and he will take them and transform them. Friends, maybe this is the, the first time you've ever done this. Maybe you've never cried out before my Lord and my God. Maybe you've never taken that step of belief. I want to give you an opportunity to do that through praying a simple prayer. But maybe this morning you're sitting there and actually there are doubts and unbeliefs and maybe unlike Thomas, you've never expressed those. And actually this morning you want to take that step of faith. You want to bring them before Jesus. Well, friends, I want to give you that same prayer to pray. And so there's going to be some words that appear on the screen. I, I, I invite you this morning simply to pray these words with me. Let's say these words together. Lord Jesus, I bring before you my doubts and unbelief. I lay them all before you. I ask that you would help me to see you, 
to look to you and to believe in you. Fill me with faith. Today I choose to receive you as my risen Saviour, my Lord and my God. And thank you that you promise, as I place my faith in you, I have life in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, then tell someone. And actually, we've got a team available at the end of this service that are waiting to, to help you, to pray with you. Or maybe you've, you've, you've prayed that prayer and actually you think, well, actually, I still really value just sharing with someone this, this doubt I've had, this, this unbelief. And so that team's available for you as well. Again, the, the link is on the screen. You can go to www.crossroadschurch.fr forward slash pray for me. Whatever you're going through, whatever challenge you have, you can do that. Or you can send us an email during the week. But it's good at times like this to maybe seal that with one other person. Well, may the Lord bless you this week. We're going to finish with one more song of worship. And then that prayer team will be available to pray with you. Amen.